I'm going to ask you some questions. They can be really personal, and all you have to do is answer either never, rarely, sometimes, or always, okay? Seriously, this has got to be one of the most eventful, most terrible years in my lifetime. But fortunately, some good films were there to ease the pain, as they often do. At first I thought I might struggle coming up with 10 titles to make a top 10 of the year. Well, as it turns out, I came up with 15, and some honorable mentions too. Like She Dies Tomorrow, a film about a woman who's been invaded by the idea that she will die tomorrow. And to top things off, this idea is contagious. I just have this feeling I'm going to die tomorrow. Like a disease spreading like a virus, which makes it one of my favorite horror films of the year. Or how about the tale of two idiotic criminals who find a giant fly? This delicious comedy from my favorite director named Quentin delivers some pretty mild chuckles. Listen, it's not the funniest movie of the year, but it's so laid back and calm, it's just soothing to watch, which is exactly what people need in this maddening year. Also, there's Adele Xercopoulos doing this. Brilliant. Feels Good Man made me feel good, man. One of the better documentaries of the year, showing how the life of an artist is drastically affected when one of his iconic creations suddenly falls into the hands of the alt-right. Probably a great companion piece with Boy's State, which made me feel both hopeful and depressed about the future of American politics. Getting slightly sidetracked from documentaries, I loved the way Spike Lee put together David Byrne's concert film American Utopia. It felt like a fantasy on the small screen, and yes, I might be a little biased considering that the first film I watched on 2020 was Stop Making Sense for the first time. Martin Eden felt like one of the most intimate epics I've ever seen. The grainy 16mm look to the images put me in a state of awe throughout the entirety of the heartwarming picture. Apparently, I'm one of the very few people who really kinda liked Wonder Woman 1984, because it made me happy. And speaking of happy, Pieces of a Woman. Yeah, that, that's a good movie. Ah, <sighs> boy, okay, great, great movies all over the place. Now let's focus on the main course, shall we? 
Kitty Green's The Assistant starts off as a matter of fact by the numbers office hours type of drama, but the more it goes on you begin to notice certain things. Details are held back and kept in the dark, characters remain off screen with us being able only to hear their voices, and along with us is Julia Gardner's character, Jane, whose methodical way of dealing with the things that go down in her workspace suddenly starts to creep under your skin and you realize this is the film industry. So there's these assumptions wow. that I'm not in charge or I'm not in control, which are so, they really rattle you as, as a filmmaker, you really feel, feel like no matter how much work I do, will anyone kind of take me seriously? And I thought if I'm getting this and I'm a film director, what are people getting who are in lower positions of like who don't have as much power as I do and how is that for them and how, how are they kind of surviving all of this? And little by little, as restrained as it might be, this procedural style movie becomes a confined horror piece. One too familiar to too many people. And if that eerie thought doesn't scare you, maybe Jude Law's apprehensive struggle to achieve some form of success in Sean Durkin's The Nest might do the trick for you. A haunted house movie where there are no ghosts, no demons, nor jump scares. No, the main threat here is... I saw some deposits you made. It's nowhere near what you're spending. Don't worry. I have a huge check coming in at the end of the month. <laughs> Capitalism and the restless thought that one needs to accomplish something in life that resembles that which we've been told is a triumph. A beautiful house, a beautiful wife, a steady job, a steady income. And when is it enough? When are we ever satisfied with the place we end up in life? Perhaps there's no way of ever being content with what we have. And instead, we push ourselves to unreachable limits that eventually become our downfall. Shannon Murphy's enchanting coming-of-age film, Baby Teeth, has a shockingly sympathetic approach to its wide array of characters. Not only to the title character played wonderfully by Eliza Scanlon, but also to her troubled family and romantic interest. You truly end up falling in love with all their distinctive personalities, as questionable as they might be. As someone who truly dislikes most coming-of-age movies, Murphy's film shatters whatever preconceived notions I might have had of the subgenre and delivers a humanizing look that pays off in one of the most stirring final scenes I've seen all year. It's a movie about finding lust for life all over again. So if you're going through a hard time or something like that, I can't recommend Baby Teeth enough. Which can't be said about this next one. The dreamlike state of mind Gaspar Noé constantly strives toward ends up making the audience feel like they're in a nightmare. Something we've all probably come to expect from this crazy Argentinian. My best moments in life are love moments or drug moments or when you mix them together. But Lux Eterna specifically hits close to home because of the simple reason that it's dealing with the pressure film workers have to go through while shooting a film. And no, I've never been on a film shoot that went down as horrifically as the one shown here. But man, is it ever stressful to see the stuff Gaspar puts on screen. It's nail-biting, edge-of-your-seat type of stuff, and it gets extra points for having a short runtime. Honestly, this and Host are proof that you can tell a compelling story in a compact 60 to 70 minutes and still deliver the goods. And speaking of short runtimes, how would you like to spend a little over 6 hours watching some good shit? Yep, it's a tie! between five films. The Small Axe Five Film Collection from mastermind Steve McQueen offers a look at five stories that go from the fight against oppression in the corrupt police system to lovingly dancing with your partner, from real-life stories of struggle in the black community in the UK to fictional encouraging tales. The work Steve's put into making each of these pieces have its own unique voice is commendable, especially considering they can go from making you feel uncomfortable to enraged to profoundly serene. On the topic of serenity, Kelly Reichardt's first cow is a slow burn that relishes in the sweetness of its characters, offering a focused look at two charming entrepreneurs who attempt to start a business in the early days of America, which proves to be a difficult task when they're in the uncomfortable situation of having to steal milk from the first cow that has arrived to those lands. Without a doubt, the shining aspect of the film is Reichardt's portrayal of their relationship between Cookie and King Lou, a bond that can seemingly withstand any and all hardships that come their way, until they inevitably take it one step too far. Also, there's many scenes of Cookie whispering sweet things in the cow's ear as he milks her, and it, I mean, it, it, it's pretty soothing. Yeah, it, it's nice. Kind of like Nomadland, the definition of a slice-of-life movie. 
we are given a character, in this case the dominating Frances McDormand who commands the screen in every single scene, and yes, she's in every single scene, and we're left to wander around the earth with her. Left in her hands as filmmaker Chloe Zhao explores the world of nomads, people that for one reason or another have moved on from their common lives and have taken to the road in their vehicles, moving from town to town, taking odd jobs and trying to live as best as they possibly can. I'm not homeless, I'm just houseless. Not the same thing, right? No. While not a lot happens in Nomadland, the rhythm that takes us from scene to scene, the characters we meet, and the seemingly endless and aimless journey that McDormand's character goes through makes for a memorable experience which will possibly end up sweeping lots of the major awards this award season. As it should. As will, hopefully, Minari, the almost autobiographical endeavor of Lee Isaac Chung that sets out to show us the struggles a Korean family faces as they move to Arkansas in the 80s to start a farm. It's kind of stressful, because you want to see them succeed so badly, but Steven Yeun's character, the father doing his best to keep the family afloat, has so many shades of self-absorption that part of you dislikes him for how focused he is on making the farm succeed at the expense of his relatives' wants and needs. But naturally, there's so much more to him. These are all complex characters in the midst of an incredibly difficult situation that doesn't get any easier from day to day. However, those feelings of unease the film gives you are quickly alleviated with the captivating presence of Alan S. Kim, who might be the best performance in the whole film? But as great performances go, that's all you'll get from every single cast member in Sound of Metal. Man, I've been waiting for this movie for such a long time. Back when it was announced as Direction France's new directorial effort, the role slowly shifted towards Darius Martyr, which makes this his debut feature film, and Jesus, holy fuck, what a way to kick things off. The highlight in this story of a heavy metal drummer who loses his hearing is definitely the sound design, putting you in the shoes of Ruben, brilliantly portrayed by Riz Ahmed, giving us one of the best performances of the year, the team behind the sound department of this film deserve all the praise they can get come Oscar season. If you're looking to have yourself a bit of a cry, this is the film you have to seek out. But if you want to get fucked up and have some fun, check out Thomas Winterberg's latest film, Another Round. A group of teachers decide to explore a philosopher's theory that every human is born with 0.05% of alcohol missing from their body. And in order to achieve this original state of fullness, they decide to remain slightly drunk throughout the day. Every day. Now, how do you think this experiment could possibly turn out? It's a fantastic film that reunites the power team that brought us The Hunt, one of the best films of 2012. And yes, in that team I include Mads Mikkelsen, Thomas Winterberg, and Thomas Bo Larsson. Another round works almost like an orchestral piece, reaching a chaotic crescendo that displays a vivid representation of people struggling to live a happy life, and succumbing to alcohol to find this spark that will revitalize them. Plus, if you're a hardcore Mads Mikkelsen fan, the final scene of this movie will blow your mind. Oh, okay, fuck it, Let's. This is, this is the big five, this is the top five films of 2020, here we go. We've previously talked about some of the great documentaries of the year 2020, but none have struck me as viscerally as time did. Director Garrett Bradley follows the journey of Fox Rich as she campaigns for her husband to be released from prison, an endeavor that takes a colossal emotional toll on Fox and her family as they face the unforgiving entity of the United States justice system. How do I articulate hope? How do I show hope? One's ability to, to hold on to their individuality and to their sense of self in a system that is systematically intended to destruct that. Bradley employs powerful storytelling elements such as the black and white color choice, the piano score, all things that emphasize how impassioned this woman is to bring her husband back home. It's a gut-wrenching experience that can, at times, be agonizing. Unlike Soul, which is just... You know, it's a picture film, it's a lot of fun. Much like Inside Out, also directed by Pete Docter, this time joined by co-director Kemp Powers, Soul gives us a glimpse into the existential planes of the afterlife and whatever comes before that, but with a touch of family friendliness. As we've come to expect from this studio, the animation is beyond outstanding, and the story itself actually had a bigger emotional impact on me than some of the latest picture films. In a year where a series of terrible things have seemingly unfolded to no end, Seoul felt like the perfect way to take off the edge during Christmas season. 
It's warm and fuzzy, it leaves you with a great message, and I'm running out of shit to say, and I don't have a subtle segue, so let's move on to... Hugh Jackman doing what he does best, playing a morally ambiguous character, only this time he doesn't physically torture anyone. No, the stakes in bad education are relatively lower. I, I mean... <laughs> most objectively lower, but Corey Finley manages to make this somewhat tragic fall from grace feel like one of the most soul-crushing experiences of the year. A superintendent gets involved in an embezzlement scandal when it's found out he's been misusing the school funds for his own benefit. But maybe not in a bad way? Or perhaps, yeah, definitely in a bad way. It's a complex story that challenges you with its every turn. And I'm surprised at how much I liked it considering Finley was coming off his debut feature film Thoroughbreds, which didn't click with me at all. Not the case with this one though, I love just about everything in this movie, from Jackman's excellent performance to Alice and Janney's excellent performance to Ray Romano's excellent performance. Yeah, it's got great acting, man, what can I say? But if you want to get a fix of great performances all across the board, The Five Bloods. Man. 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 Spike Lee hasn't been this good in years. This epic tale follows five Vietnam veterans who travel back to Vietnam to pay respects to their fallen brother, played terrifically by Chadwick Boseman by finding his remains and bringing them back home. I mean, also it doesn't hurt that they left a shitload of gold buried over there back in the day. Yeah, I mean, it's got a lot of overused elements of greed and gold and ambition, things that date all the way back to films like Treasure of the Sierra Madre and Apocalypse Now, but Lee crafts such a unique perspective to his every joint, and this one in particular ends up delivering a powerful punch to the gut. Delroy Lindo. I mean, fuck, man. Delroy Lindo. Put respect on that name and praise his acting chops, because my dear god, can this man act. He delivers hands down the most immersive monologue of 2020, pulling you in, strapping you down, and looking straight into your soul as he speaks some visceral lines of dialogue. However, there was one other film in 2020 that, well, really affected me. You know, it's rare for me to stick with a movie that I really loved at the beginning of the year up until the time when I have to make my best of the year list. Simply because, well, things change in my mind. I start to see more of the film's flaws. Sometimes the high I got from watching it for the first time simply fades away. Last time I watched a movie in April that ended up being my number one of the year was back in 2018 with Lynn Ramsey's You Were Never Really Here. I was shocked at the staying power that her film had with me. And, well, I guess that's just the effect that a really good movie has, which is the case with Eliza Hitman's Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. This film honestly hypnotized me with its unlikely heroes. These two girls embark on an odyssey as young Autumn, played by Sidney Flanagan, sets off to New York with her cousin to terminate an unintended pregnancy. No, it's not a masterpiece, but it is a masterclass in subtlety and simplicity and manages to be the equivalent of cinematic fireworks at certain points. From April until now, I don't think I've quite stopped thinking about how much I like this film. And though I can't really put my finger on what it is, I feel like it will stick with me for a long time to come.